हेलो फ्रेंड्स सो आई बी टॉकिंग वेरी ब्रीफली ऑन जस्ट अ डायग्नोसिस ऑफ न्यूमोसिस्टिस जीरो वीसी so we had one challenging case in our icu so it was uh, imperative that we delved into what are the diagnostic uh, tools that are available to diagnose this because this pneumocystis gerovici now which is classified as a fungal infection um, so is fairly commonly encountered in icu especially in someone who is immunocompromised so it is important to have a clarity as to how do we approach in diagnosing and establishing this infection so with that in background so i thought i'll just cover talk on maybe next 4 to 5 minutes on only the diagnostic approach or how do we diagnose pneumocystis gerovici and as you see the pictures it looks something like this so actually it was classified as parasite before now it is uh, considered as fungus uh, so so this was a patient who was a 61 year old uh, basically who has who was on methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis and uh, diabetic and hypertension um, so, so this was a 61 year old who came with acute short of breath so his symptoms started since 2 uh, to 3 months and it was progressive in nature and he came with uh, severe hypoxemia to icu and he had a rheumatoid arthritis for which he was on methotrexate so i want the intent is not to discuss the whole case just i'm showing you the uh, you saw the x ray which did not show too much of shadows it just showed some sort of a, a ground glassing and uh, when we did ct i'll just show you the video of this ct so you would see that there is lot of ground glassing i'll just tell you the uh, the ct that was described uh, in a formal report so there is septal thickening bit of a traction bronchiectasis and there is areas of uh, evolving alveolar opacities and consolidation as you can see uh, so the whole thought process in this case so this is a gentleman 61 year old 2 to 3 months progressive history uh, progressive history of uh, cough with progressive short of breath on the background of rheumatoid arthritis on methotrexate and x ray just shows some sort of a ground glassing but here if you see the ct he had some cavity as you see uh, but he had a old tuberculosis so he, uh, so the ct had septal thickening and the ground glassing opacities and lot of areas of consolidation with alveolar based opacities so that was the description so when when we get a case like this obviously the whole thought process is whether this is a ild induced by rheumatoid arthritis or methotrexate lung or a superseded infection so obviously as an intensivist every listener here would dwell about establishing any infective etiology so one of the infection that is contemplated in this situation is pneumocystis and since he has a cavity aspergillus also is contemplated and you would obviously want to rule out bacterial infection so this is the way one would approach and just showing very briefly the investigations as i said the intent is not to talk too much about this case how it progressed so this was the routine investigation some little bit of anemia total count was low initially and then it went up uh, and then you can see plated pretty much everything was reasonably normal as you see there's no sinister problems in many of the uh, routine tests that you would do lfts were normal coax was normal so blood cultures done was negative urine culture was negative so like anyone would do in icu these days you would do multiplex pcr so we did the same to look for any exotic uh, viral infections or covid was negative so respiratory biofire was negative so this to look at all the infections that could possibly occur in the lung and as you see crp was high ldh was uh, not very high because in pneumocystis the classic teaching we possibly would remember is that ldh would be high so it was not very high hba was 7 and esr was so obviously there is an ongoing inflammation crp is high esr is high and uh, this was done anyway so ecg was normal so you would want to do an echo especially when someone is very hypoxemic and uh, who is requiring high fi2 he, he was on niv and intermittent hfno requiring up to 60 to 70% uh, so normal filling pressure echo is normal so there is no uh, cardiac cause for pulmonary edema and thyroid was normal ana was done that was negative ana profile was done that was negative procal was a bit high and galactomannan levels this uh, it is uh, higher than the reference range so i will talk about galactomannan in another video about what is the relevance of galactomannan 
the reason we did this was because he had a cavity and we needed to see uh, rule out aspergillus. So we'll talk about it in the next video. This video is mainly I'll talk on approach to PCP and complements was done. That was normal. So there was no active autoimmune process. If you look at the face of it, uh, CRP was high, ESR was high, but complements being normal. So there's no cytokine sort of an activation, which would obviously push the uh, complements to go down. That has not happened. So NA was negative. So this was the sort of, so the whole uh, thought was, how do we rule out PCP in this patient? So, so what is the diagnostic? Obviously, X-ray would not tell you PCP. Uh, if you look at any X-ray or CT, it can look in a varied way, crown glass opacities, whatever you saw, it could, uh, it could be a part of PCP as well. So the diagnostic tests that are currently available for PCP, obviously culture is out because this uh, PCP, which is a fungus, cannot be cultured. It does not grow in the culture. So the, the, the standard traditional way of establishing is to do staining. So you have to get a sputum and you have to do a staining. So there are different stains that are available and this stain will show the trophic site, the trophic uh, forms of this PCP and it will show the cystic forms. Uh, but the whole problem we had with this patient is no matter what we did, he wouldn't get the sputum out. So direct fluorescent antibody staining is what uh, could be done. So these are antibodies which are tagged to the fluorescent, uh, to the antibodies, and we use this fluorescent antibody staining to detect the trophic forms. So the trophic forms of PCP look something like this. And these have to be stained with a special stain. So these are the stains that are used to look at the trophic forms, right? Gimsa, Gram, Weigart, and modified Papaniculov. And then there are cystic forms. So cystic forms of PCP look something like this. And to see these cystic form, the stains that are typically uh, suggested in the literature are calcofluor white, cresylect violet, gomery methane, and tolidine blue. So these are the stains. So methanamine silver is something you would have commonly heard. So, but these are the stains that are suggested to look at the trophic and the cystic form. So this is the standard. But one thing uh, I think every listener should bear in mind is PCP, the burden of finding this trophic form or cystic form is very good in HIV patients. And if you look at the literature of PCP, it is basically divided into HIV PCP and non-HIV PCP. And this patient clearly was a non-HIV PCP. In non-HIV PCP, the burden of this PCP is low. So, and even to get this uh, cystic form or trophic form to be identified in staining, the yield becomes little less. So, in the histopathology and staining of the lung tissue, uh, basically in PCP shows all the septal thickening that you saw in the CT. And there's a lot of in lymphomatic uh, infiltrates and these alveolar spaces have eosinophilic uh, sort of inclusions, as you see. And uh, in staining in the lung tissue, PCP looks like this. So basically, they look like uh, what I showed you in the first picture. Uh, so, so this is the way post-staining the PCP looks in the lung tissue. These are just the pictures. So this is just to give a comparative analysis as to how X-rays look. See, if you look in HIV patients, the features of PCP is very striking. As you see, you can see a lot of hilar shadows, interstitial shadows, and little ground glassing. But in non-HIV, you don't see this. And in HIV patients, the load of PCP is more dense. So you would see very easily on the staining on the sputum or in the lung tissue, you will see a lot of this PCP very clearly. But in non-HIV, if you see, the lungs don't look very classic of PCP. So as you see, compared to the HIV, it is not very striking. It's not very easy to say that this someone could have PCP. And even if you do staining, the density of these uh, uh, PCP fungus is not as dense as in HIV. So this poses a challenge. So the, the point that I'm trying to highlight is it is not easy to pick up PCP on staining in a non-HIV with a traditional methods with staining. So we need to use something more than this. So that is what is uh, I want listeners to just bear in mind. So the respiratory specimen that is advocated is induced sputum. So here in our patient, no matter what we did, we use 3%, 7%, 20% saline to induce the sputum. He would just not get any sputum. So induced sputum is the recommended sort of a way to get the sputum out to look at the, to and to do the staining. The diagnostic yield in induced sputum 
is 50 to 90 percent in HIV patients. But in non-HIV, the yield becomes much lower. So the ability to recognize PCP in an induced sputum in non-HIV is low. So so would be in our case. Even if induced, the possibility of finding out this PCP by doing this staining with Jimsa Bright and so on and so forth would not be very great. Then the next option we have is bronchoscopy. So do a bro bronchoscopy and do a BAL. So this was a study from Italy where they showed the bronchoalveolar lavage will give a good positivity. So they looked at 48 patients with suspected PCP and they found BAL yielded uh, PCP in the staining in 47, which means BAL is a good way to go about getting the sputum and doing it. So in our patient, he was on 70% intermittent NIVHFNO. So uh, the risk of intubation was very high. So our pulmonologist also felt that uh, the benefit, uh, the risk would outweigh the benefit. And most of family also was not keen that we push him to a ventilator that he has to get tube. So they really didn't want him to head that way. So anyway, we won't discuss too much about this case. He, he's getting better anyway. So, so if we add PCR, to the bronchoalveolar lavage. So the additional yield, it would increase by 7%. So there would be 7% increase in uh, in uh, in the yield in addition to typical bal stain that you would do. So that is something that uh, we need to bear in mind. So you would get an additional benefit of plus 7% if you do PCR on the bal specimen. So, so this was just a study for all the listeners. It's good to, uh, because there's not too much of data on PCP. So the PCR is a good test. So this was a study from France where they looked at 448 samples and the traditional staining, the GIMSA and immunofluorescence uh, showed PCP in 8.7% of these immunocompromised patients. And out of this 39, PCR was positive in 87%. So where staining was positive in 39, PCR showed positivity in 87% of these. But the opposite was true where 32 who were positive in PCR were negative in GIMSA, which means PCR had a higher ability to recognize PCP where your traditional staining was negative. So the PCR conferred additional benefit. So what we're trying to stress is in non-HIV, where to recognize PCP in routine staining becomes uh, less likely. So the PCR would enhance the, your ability to recognize or identify P, uh, PCP and the way to go about is to do PCR in the BAL specimen or in the sputum, induced sputum specimen that would enhance your yield. That is the point I'm trying to make. And here they did follow up to see whether they really had PCP. They followed 21 patients and 14 had a definitive evidence of them having PCP, the pneumocystis with PCR, which means to say PCR definitely was a superior test compared to a routine staining in its ability to identify. And we are all using PCR, so it's fairly easy to get a sputum and get a PCR and rule out your PCP. And PC, as I said, PCR on BAL or bronchial lavage or induced sputum increases the diagnostic yield. This is something you can keep in mind uh, rather than just ruling out PCP just on doing uh, staining on the sputum. So that is the point. So now uh, the point I wanted to discuss is about beta D glucon because not many, honestly, may be very much aware that beta D glucon also is a reasonable tool to look at. See, in our patient, we couldn't do obviously BAL because of patient's consent and the very high risk, risk of pain and the possibility of him landing up on a ventilator. And he just wouldn't get sputum irrespective of what we do. So the only test that we can do, which is a surrogate, is beta-D glucan assay. So it is good for trainees to understand beta-D glucan is a reasonable test to contemplate to look as a screening for PCP. Let us look into the study. So this study from Japan showed that it had a good sensitivity in patients with HIV with PCP, and it had a high negative predictive value. What, what it means is if it is negative, beta-D glucan, it rules out the possibility of PCP. But if it is positive, there is a likelihood that he could have a PCP as an infection. So, and sensitivity is low. The sensitivity becomes low where the burden of this PCP is low or in non-HIV. Again, in our patient, the beta D glucan sensitivity would possibly fall down. So in HIV, it is easier to diagnose. In non-HIV, these tests are sometimes challenging. The whole problem with beta D glucan is the cutoff value because they have been unable to ascertain what is the best cutoff value. More than 80 picograms per ml is taken as 
cut off as an arbitrary thing, but it's not well defined. So this was a study that came from Japan, where they looked at 295 samples and sensitivity of beta D glucone in identifying PCP was 92%, specificity was 86%. And here they used a lower cutoff. They used a cutoff of 31.1 picograms per ml. And this was another study from US where they looked at 400 immunocompromised patients. And here they took cutoff of 80 picograms as recommended and sensitivity was 70%. And specificity was 81%. And if they took a higher cutoff of 200, since specificity goes up to 100%. So which means to say beta D glucon is a reasonable test. And these are the studies that are available to do at least as a screening, and which was as a high negative predictive value. So in our patient, we did beta D glucon assay and uh, that came positive. So we treated for PCP, so on and so forth. So, uh, so the point we are trying to make is you in ICU, we may encounter challenging patients like ours who has an ILD, who was on disease modifying drugs and who had an evolving consolidation. And we did discuss with our radiologist who also felt there could be possible infective etiology in addition to underlying ILD. So, and here obviously there was a debate whether should we use higher dose of steroids to mitigate the progression of ILD. And we would be limited because we had to rule out infection. So, and PCP is something we have to rule out in these patients. So, in these patients, it is prudent that the best way to do is get an induced putum. So, if you fail to get induced, if there is a window to do BAL, go ahead and do a BAL and do a PCR on BAL because you are routine silver staining or you are uh, Jimsa right staining, so on and so forth. The diagnostic yield would be much less in non HIV patient. So if you're not able to do BAL also, and you are not able to do uh, lung biopsy is far-fetched in these situations. So if you're not able to get induced sputum, if you're not able to do BAL and do PCR, then at least we can think of doing beta D glucone to see whether we can rule out PCP and uh, then take it from there. So that was the point of uh, making this little talk. So, so that's about it. So beta D glucone is something that you could keep in mind. But the best is obviously to do a BAL and do a PCR on BAL in addition to staining. So that would be the take-home message. So that's about it. So I, maybe in the next talk, I would talk about galactomannan and the studies to what is uh, what is the relevance, what are the caveats of uh, galactomannan in Aspergillus and so on and so forth. So, so thank you one and all.